reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Dr. Hayek, in your early studies, you pursued uh, not just law, but psychology and economics at the law school mm -hmm. uh, in Vienna. Was this sort of uh, triple threat uh, competence uh, common among your contemporaries? Well, common among that group who studied not merely for entering a profession, but because of intellectual interest, yes, but it was a small part of the total student population. But they were the same people who even in their subject would do more than was essential for examinations. I mean, most of those who would uh, voluntarily attend a seminar beyond their formal lectures would also not be interested only in economics, but would go outside. But it's partly, of course, connected with the whole organization of the study. I mean, uh, in general, and certainly in all the non-experimental subjects, instruction was almost entirely confined to formal lectures. There were no tests except uh, three main examinations, mostly at the very end of your study. So beyond the purely formal requirement that the professor testified your attendance in your lecture book. You were under no control whatever. You chose your own lectures, very few of them were compulsory. And most of them would not confine themselves to lectures required for their exam. Uh, I mean, we were entirely free, really, in what we did. <coughs> provided that we were ready to be orally examined. You see, the examinations were oral examinations only. We did no written work at all for our whole study, or no obligatory written work. If uh, there were some practical exercises in legal subjects where we discussed particular things, but even they were not obligatory at the time, in the law faculty, it, uh, especially, I think the probably numerically the majority of the students hardly ever saw the university, but went to a coach, and the coach prepared them for the final exam. So even the attendance of the lectures would be small, and uh, part of those who were really intellectually interested was even smaller. But I think what it amounts to is, let's say, of the six, eight hundred students in one year of law were larger in the immediate post-war period because many uh, years had been compressed in that period. Perhaps a hundred would attend the lectures, perhaps a twenty would have acute intellectual interest, but if you were in that group, you constantly moved them, would meet the same men in your law lectures and the art history lectures or in anything. It all happened in one building, I mean, the, at least except for the institutes and the experimental subjects, it was all in the university building. So even if you had in your regular program an hour free, you walked over to the philosophy faculty and tried different lectures which you liked and which you did not like. And that is the atmosphere that you came to miss eventually in London. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel that uh, uh, this, in this respect, uh, things have changed uh, in, in your lifetime, that the universities that you visit now, um, it's becoming more uh, uncommon, perhaps. Oh, I'm sure have I, it has been more uncommon. I'm sure even in Vienna, also, I've been very much out of contact, and that university, more than one respect, is not what it used to be. It certainly is not. Uh, in existence in England. Well, of course, there is another point. Uh, in the Continental University at the time, there was a very great 
break between the discipline of school and the complete freedom at the university. And a good many people got lost in the tra tradition. And you had to learn to find your own way and mostly to those who were any good learn to study on their own with just a little advice and stimulus from the lectures. But a great number of students did not finish their degrees. A great many fell by the way, yes. Yeah. I think the proportion of those who entered the university, those who completed, must have been, I don't suppose more than half of those who entered really completed the course. What are your views on uh, the advantages of of specializing or of pursuing more than one field seriously, the way you and the best of your contemporaries did? Well, it certainly was a very beneficial in our time, whether it's still possible, where the amount of factual knowledge you have to acquire, even for a first degree, you know, I think we were more lively and more in uh, asking ready to ask questions, but we knew factually less than a present-day student does. We were able to pick and choose very largely. It didn't matter if we neglected one subject up to a point. Uh, I think on any sort of test of competence in our special subject, we were probably less well-trained than a present-day student. On the other hand, we preserved an open mind, we were interested in a great many things, and we are not well-trained specialists, but we knew how to acquire knowledge on a subject. And I find nowadays that even men of high reputation in their subject wouldn't know what to do if for their own purpose they had to learn a new subject. And to us this was no problem, we constantly did it. We had the confidence, more or less, that if you seriously wanted to pursue a subject, you knew the technique of how to learn about it. Another aspect of that was that many of your contemporaries were very interested in methodology and in philosophy, um, and retained an interest mm -hmm. throughout their careers. Um, it's a common attitude that you often meet today that this is not worthwhile and so on. Uh, but uh, if you were not as competent perhaps in your specialized subjects, from uh, the contrast between the various fields that you pursued came this interest in methodology. I'm not sure what the answer is. It may have been purely accidental in our circle that the interest in methodology was so high was to some extent uh, brought by some of my colleagues who went elsewhere for a semester. I mean, when people like Schütz and Kaufmann went to Freiburg to study under Husserl, or Fürth and uh, Minz went to Heidelberg to study there for a semester, they brought back philosophical ideas, partly because an Austrian student going to another u German university doesn't use that semester to continue law, but he looks around for other subjects. So we had special stimulus in our discussion circle to be interested in philosophical problems and whether, apart from these uh, special reasons, it would have been as in, well, of course, there was also the great general fashion in Vienna due to the influence of Mach on the whole intellectual outlook. There was this almost excitement about matters of uh, the scientific method due to the influence of Mach very largely. All that came together and was probably more, I don't, I don't know in Vienna of any other similar group like our little group, the Geistkreis. Uh, there may have been others, uh, but I don't know them. Yeah. Well, it was also carried on, this uh, influence from Mach by the Vienna Circle and uh, Schlick and Carnap mm. by Wittgenstein. But that was more, much more definitely a philosophical circle, but our group whether we, we happened to be all ex-law students, law was the least subject we ever considered in our circle. Uh, 
it was either social sciences or literature or uh, well, sociology is a social science, in the sociology in the widest sense. Felix Kaufmann brought in from the Schlick circle the approach of the natural sciences, uh, a great deal of uh, semi-practical aspects, in the fact that somebody like Alfred Schütz was uh, by profession secretary of the Banking Association, while he was in one sense the most philosophical, he was most intimately connected with daily events. Do you feel that Vienna was uniquely good in producing this uh, first-rate intellectual talent that were also men of affairs at the same time? Uh, in that particular period, uh, I don't know of any similar... Well, yes, uh, it seems to have been also in Budapest. I have when you learned about it much later, but in a way the number of distinguished scholars, uh, scientists with a broad interest compared with population, and even more if you compare it with the relevant population, which in Budapest is almost entirely exclusively the Jewish population of Budapest, which was not true in Vienna, I think Budapest was even more productive than Vienna in yeah. the same period. Yeah. But I didn't know it at the time. I but these were not ivory tower people either. Oh no, oh no, yeah. very far from it. And the Vienna people, for the reasons I discussed already, were very far from ivory tower people because they had to earn a living as well. So it was partly out of necessity. Yeah. Yeah. How did it come about that you founded a circle like the Geistkreis? It included a great many people uh, of uh, later distinction. Well, the initiative came from Herbert Fürth, whom you know. He first approached me whether I would join with him in asking those people whom we had known in the university, partly actual contemporaries in the law faculty, partly a few personal friends of his more than mine, like Gluck, the art historian, and, uh, well, my contribution, uh, well, I have hardly any distinct contribution, selection of persons. I think he had a wider knowledge of, I mean, my biologist friend, in fact, in my generation, I hadn't any biologist friends. I don't know why this was, except my own younger brother, the anatomist. So I hardly contributed in the selection of personnel. Fürth was a... Well, I knew, I think part of the reason is that I was away for the most uh, important period of forming the circle. We formed it immediately after I left the university, but I remained only for a year and a half then in Vienna before I went to America. The circle started on a very small scale during that period, but it grew while I was in America. Yes. I think that is the reason why Fürth made much more definite contribution to the composition than I did. What was the method of selection? Uh, did, did you have uh, something like a program in mind when you approached other people? No. no. Uh, what? None at all. I they were I all think in the lawyers. beginning, uh, Herbert Furt and I would just talk people over, oh, is this usable or not for this sort of discussion group, um, uh, selecting from the people we knew, and then some other members might make suggestions, and if the rest of us knew about a man, they agreed that he was a man. But were you intent on uh, making it an economics discussion? Oh, no. No, very yeah. far from it. Uh, I suppose the uh, feeling was rather there were too many economists in it already. So you try, try to broaden it? I mean, after Machlup, Haberle and I uh, were part of the nucleus, I think we felt econ economics was sufficiently represented. So Machlup and Haberle and yourself mm -hmm. and Fürst, can you... Well, he wasn't really a Kaufmann, you have mentioned. He, 
He learned a lot of economics by that association, but he was not pri primarily interested in economics. He finally made use of this when he had to go to the United States to get a position as an economist. But in Vienna, he was not an economist. He went to the Federal Reserve Board yes. uh, once he came here. Oh, even no, I think he began with a teaching post at one of the Negro universities in Washington. Howard. Yes. yes, I believe. So, Firth and Kaufmann, mm -hmm. and what were some of the other? Vögelin, Schütz, Alfred Schütz, a sociologist, Glück, the art and literary historian. Uh, uh, one or two people who later left, who were very active at the beginning. One or two Germans who had been students in Vienna and returned to Germany, a man called Overhoff, who recently died. Again, uh, <coughs> I don't know whether he retained it from Vienna, a man who became a very successful industrialist and wrote novels on the side. <coughs> yeah. um, so, well, we several people whom have completely lost sight of just the members and names who were there in the beginning. Fürth is the only one who is now a complete list. In fact, I passed on my list to him. He lost all his papers when he left Vienna, so he didn't bring anything himself. And when I found a carbon copy of a list he had sent me many, many years before I returned it to him, that he should be in, uh, possess the essential information. I no, didn't keep. It was the time before Xerox. So. Now, in the, in this uh, circle, Kaufmann would talk, for example, on logical positivism, and I suppose that you and Habler and Maklub would give uh, what early versions of the papers you were working on yes. for this uh, for this circle. Yes, I, I spoke on psychology, for instance. I did at that time expound to them what ultimately became my sensory order book. And uh, I think I spoke about American economics when I came back from the United States. Uh, Kaufman, uh, yes, it was much more generally on scientific method. I remember, for instance, that I got, we got from him an extremely uh, instructive lecture on entropy and its whole relation to probability problems, and uh, another one on topology, <coughs> all this interest on borderline subjects, relevant, uh, I think. He, he was an excellent teacher in the literal sense. In a paper by Kaufmann, you really knew what the subject was about. Yeah. And what were some, of, do you remember some other topics that would seem perhaps far from economics and the concern of an economist? Vögelin, who is now here, I read a paper on Rembrandt, I remember, and uh, uh, Franz Glück, the literary man, uh, spoke on Stifter, and Vögelin uh, again on semi-political <coughs> political subjects, Schütz on uh, existentialist philosophy, uh, no, uh, phenomenolo phenomenology. I think there were very few economics papers really in that. So group. no restriction on subject no, matter no, no, whatsoever. No, no. What was the format? Uh, did the famous Vienna cafes play any role? And that, that was all in the private homes. It went around from house to house after dinner affair. I suppose all was offered for a few sandwiches and tea. I'm sitting around in a circle or sometimes around a table. I suppose the normal attendance would be under a dozen. Ten, eleven, something like that. It was an exclusively male group. Were you anti-feminist? No, it was impractical. Under the then existing social traditions, it, was create so, it created so many complications to have a girl among us that we just decided. See, the name was even given by 
a lady whom you probably have met, who resented being excluded, and so <laughs> he gave us the name Geistkreis, rather to ridicule the whole of it. Yes, but it stuck, and, and you now it's remember. Like, oh, yes, we remember as such. Uh, we accepted it. Uh, uh, Martha Stephanie Brown, I don't yes. know her. Yes. In fact, if you want the anecdotes of the time, she would be an <laughs> inexhaustible source. Yeah. Uh, let me turn to um, the other circles in which you moved. Um, first, in in economics, um, there was a Meyer seminar at the university, and then there was a Mises seminar that were, was in effect outside the university. But the Mises seminar was the more the more important. To me, uh, yes, uh, very much the uh, most important. The Maya seminar was uh, almost completely confined to marginal utility analysis. It took place at a time uh, which was inconvenient to most of us who were already in a job. I did, in fact, am not certain I ever attended the seminar <laughs> Myers. I did see Meyer. Meyer was a coffee house man mainly. The only place he was to be found was late in the evening in the coffee house, a Künstler Café opposite the university. And I did sit there with him and a group of his students many times and quite informal this, uh, talk, which I'm afraid was more. Uh, much more university scandal and <laughs> similar things than serious. So occasionally it were interesting discussion. He could get very excited, particularly if he strongly disagreed with somebody. And uh, there were all these stories about his constant quarrel with Ottmar Spann, which unfortunately dominated the university situation. But uh, on our generation, his influence was very limited. Perhaps Rosenstein Rosen, Rodin was the main contact. Of course, Rosenstein Rodin and uh, Morgenstern were for a time editing for Meyer the Vienna Zeitschrift. In fact, they were the two editorial secretaries and in fact run it for all intents and purposes. Yes, I think Rosenstein and uh, Rosenstein, who was never a member of the Geistkreis, I don't know why, Morgenstern was. Uh, they were the main contact to the Meyer circle. But uh, after I had left, at least after I, you know, only after I returned from America, it was the Mises Circle and later the National Economic Gesellschaft in a more formal manner, which was a real center of discussion. And even the Mises Seminar was by no means confined to economics. It was uh, not so much general methodological problems, but the relations between Economics and history were a very much discussed province, which we always returned. And there, in many ways, you had the same people as in the Geistkreis, not exactly. When some, like Striegel, among the economists, and Engel Janusz, the historian, I think he became later a member of the Geistkreis after I had left. Yes, I did, I'm sure he did. Uh, and the women who were excluded right. from the Geistkreis, Steffi Braun and Helene Liesel and uh, Ilse Mintz, were all members of the Mises Seminar, but not of the Geistkreis. So how large was that group? Uh, how many regulars in the Mises Seminar? Oh, it was about the same number, because the non-economists were not good, the real non-economists were non-social scientists, people like Vögelin or Schütz. Oh, Schütz did yes, attend, but uh, Glück, the literary man, uh, and these two Germans I mentioned before who disappeared. But the people who were not interested in economics, uh, there were a good many not interested in economics in the Geistkreis, but none in uh, the Mises seminar, even if they were not technically economists. These seminars would go on year after year, then, and people would come. You, you attended over six, seven From years? From 1924 till I left. Yes. 24 to 31. 
And others must have been members for 10 years. Oh, uh, probably, you see. I think when Uncle Mises left in 36, and it had started before I came back from America, I believe even before I went to America, I didn't know about it. So people like Stephanie Brown and Lene Lisa and Striegel probably attended from 1923 to 1936. Yeah. I think it must have gone on for 13 yeah. years. That's probably likely duration. So now this was outside the university and it was not in his capacity as a titular professor no way, or no. anything like this. So no, it, was it was he <coughs> who attracted people to the seminar. Entirely. It was in his office at the Chamber of Commerce in the evening. Always continued visit to the, within the visit to the coffee house, so things is likely to have gone on from 6 to 12 at night. The whole affair, we probably sat for two hours in the official seminar and then... How often? Uh, every two weeks. Every two weeks. In the real term period, probably from late October till early June. Well, Mises ran at least two famous seminars in his life like this. Maybe three in G Geneva as well, but I'm thinking now of first Vienna, mm -hmm. and then uh, much later in his life, uh, a similar seminar in New York. Which I once attended, yes, I've seen there. But that was much more an academic institution, I mean, it was in a classroom with relatively large numbers attendant, while uh, his private seminar, he was sitting on his ordinary desk and so it was a small table, a conference table in the room, and uh, we were grouped in the other corner of the room, facing him at his desk. But it had no academic atmosphere at all. I mean, well, the New York seminar, which I knew, it was on a platform, and uh, so it looked like an academic class, and it was probably also a much wider range. There were real students there, well, they were new students in the Mises Seminar in Vienna. We're all graduates or doctors. And... Uh, but maybe the Vienna Seminar was the more fruitful one. I think it was, yes. That it stimulated more people to do work that became real contributions. You know, when I think about it, I see I forget a few older people who attended the Mises Seminar. There was that... Uh, interesting man, Schlesing, who wrote a book on money, who was a banker in Vienna. There was occasionally another, an industrialist, Dr. Geiringer, who all used to come in, who was a, a industrialist. Uh, he must have been originally in industry when at that time he was also a banker, but he was one of the joint stock banks, where Schlesinger was a private banker. There may have been one or two other people. Yes, there was a uh, high government official who occasionally came, a man called Forchheimer, mainly interested in sort of social security problems. Oh, the average age of the Vienna seminar must have been at least in the 30s. While, as far as I could see, the one occasion I visited, the New York seminar was much more a student's affair than the so-called Mises Seminar in Vienna, which was a discussion club. Now, Mises personally, the view here in the United States, I mm. think, is of Mises in his old age. Mm. And he's viewed very often, particularly by his enemies, of course, as, as very doctrinaire. Do you feel that he got doctrinaire with age? Was he, was he a different man in Vienna back then than he became later? He was always a little doctor in there. I think he was not so susceptible to take offense as he was later. I think he had a period of, well, he always had been rather bitter. He had been treated very badly all through his life, really. And that hard period when he arrived in New York and was unable to get an appropriate position made him very much more bitter. On the other hand, oh, there was a counter effect. He became more human when he married. You see, he was a bachelor so long as I knew him in Vienna. 
and uh, was in a way harder and uh, even more intolerant of fools <laughs> than he was later. When they, if you re look at his autobiography, the contempt of his for most of the German economists was very justified. But uh, I think 20 years later he would put, have put it into more conciliatory form. His opinion hadn't really changed, but he would have spoken up as openly as in that particular very bitter moment when he just arrived in America and didn't know what his future would be. Uh, on the whole, I think he softened, was softened by marriage. He, he mellowed personally, uh, but, uh, but um, he became more demanding of intellectual allegiance from, from yes, his students. Yes, so he yeah. easily took offense even when one of, I believe I am the only one of his disciples who has never quarreled with him. And that includes all the disciples from, from uh, the, oh, I know. the circle in, in Vienna. No, I'm speaking about the, one, the old ones in Vienna. Yes, the, the old ones in, yeah. in Vienna, yeah. yeah. Now, there were um, some other uh, circles. Um, the Austrian Economic Association was, was another forum where economists yes. met. Uh, that had existed from before World War I, was still going when I took my degree and I attended one of two meetings and then it died during the inflation period. I don't know what was. I mean, the short but acute inflation period upset social life and great many things. I mean, uh, I think it was part of the question of expense. The Economic Society used to meet at a coffee house and hire a room there. And I think the expense of doing so during the height of the inflation was one of the probably contributing factors. We were all also too busy. Life was too hard. And uh, the reason why I then took the initiative of reconstituted it was because I rather regretted the division which had arisen between the Mises and the Meyer circle. There was no form which they met at all. And by restarting this nominally still existing society, there was at least one occasion where they would sit on the same table and discuss. And uh, where a good many people who either did not come to the Mises seminar or not come to the Meyer seminar met including a few of the more senior industrialists and civil servants. So it was a larger group, I suppose, with either of the two other groups, hardly ever counted more than a dozen in the Economic Society, National Economic Gesellschaft, numbers would go up to 30 or so. Even that wasn't larger. And uh, later it met in the office in a meeting hall of the Bankers Association. Lena Lisa was uh, one of the secretaries. Uh, in fact, there were two women, uh, women who were both very competent economists, Marianne Herzfeld, an older woman, although I believe she may still be alive or died only recently in Edinburgh, who wrote once a very good article on the on inflationism as a philosophy or something like that. And uh, Lena Lisa, of course. Uh, Le uh, Lisa became secretary of the International Economic Association. For a time she was, yes. yes. And then she died relatively early, in her, I suppose, her 50s or six, just about 60. Uh, so that was a more mixed group I believe the only paper I read there was my later pamphlet on uh, rent restriction. You mentioned the inflation uh, in context of uh, why uh, the Economic Association uh, died for a while. There's another thing that I think is interesting to discuss. Uh, we have now talked about the various circles mm. uh, in which you moved. And uh, there's the intellectual 
influence from uh, the people that uh, more mm. some of whom dominated their circle as, as Mises did to some extent. So there are those influences on uh, you to in part determine what kind of work you did and what problems. But there are also the influence of events, uh -huh. the inflation being one. And uh, of course, when you came back fr uh, from the war, uh, you lived through the dissolution of the Austro-Hungary uh, yeah. uh, Hungary, uh, Empire. Uh -huh. uh, and the inflation came mm -hmm. on top of that. And Vienna became a, s a rather overgrown capital of a s very small, mm -hmm. small country. Um, how much did events determine your long, lifelong interests, and to what extent did uh, purely intellectual influences play a role? Intellectual in influence became more and more to predominate. I think in the beginning, the practical ones were more important. And I can give you one illustration. I think the first paper I ever wrote never published, and I knew it, I don't even think I know, I haven't got a copy, was a thing which had already occurred to me in the last few days in the army, suggesting that you might have a double government, a cultural and economic government. And uh, I played for a time with that idea in the hope of uh, resolving the conflict between nationalities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I thought, uh, did see the benefits of a common economic government. I said, on the other hand, very much aware of all the conflicts about education and similar problems. And I thought it might be possible in governmental functions to separate the two things, have the nationalities, have their own cultural arrangements, and yet let the central government provide the framework of a common economic system. That was really my first uh, thing I put on paper. Have you ever returned to the, those ideas? There are still areas of the world where the same problems uh, yes, occur. Yes, my approach is so completely different. Yes, in a sense, the problem is the same, but I n n no longer believe that that sort of division is of any practical possibility. But in a way, I played with constitutional reform uh, in the beginning and the end of my career. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, on the intellectual influences then, um, which ones would you mention first in your student days? I mean, in personal influences or literary influences? Well, let's take literary influences first, perhaps. Well, I think the main point is that the ac accident that, curiously enough, Ottmar Spant at that time still told me that the book on economics to read were Menger's Grundsätze. And that was the first book which gave me an idea of a possibility of theoretically approaching economic problems. It was probably the most important event. The curious fact is that Spann, who became such a heterodox uh, person, was among my immediate teachers, the only one who had been a personal student among Andermenger. And the book which made him famous, his Haupttheorie in the Volkswirtschaftslehre, which in his first edition was a very good popular handbook, is supposed to really have been a cribbed version of Menger's lectures in the history of economics. Yes, I've heard that. And personal influences. We have talked about Mises already, mm -hmm. but there are also others. Senior persons, I mean, uh, we have spoken also about my contemporaries, and to some extent the influence of my father, which was uh, of some importance. I don't think there are really any personal influences. I did, l I mean, at the university, I did take an interest in a great many men, but no single man had a distinct influence on me. 
movement. Well, in a purely literary field, I was reading much more fine literature as a young man, and probably become aware I was a great Goethe fan. I was thoroughly familiar with the writings of Goethe, with the German literature generally, which is incidentally partly the influence of my father. My father used to read to us after dinner uh, the great German dramas and uh, plays, and he knew he had an extraordinary memory and could put things like the Glocke, the Schiller's poem, from beginning to end from heart, even in his, uh, well, I can't say his old age, he died at 57. He was, in the sense of German literature, an extraordinary educated man, and looks interest, and as a young man before the war, and even immediately after, I spent many evenings at the Burgtheater. I was, in fact, as a very young man, of course, I started writing plays myself. Not very, didn't get very far with that, but uh, I think if you ask in uh, this sense, general influence, Goethe is really probably the most important literary influence on my early thinking. Yeah. In economics, let me come back to a question we've touched upon before. In the 20s in Vienna, was there such a thing as an Austrian school in economics? Uh, did you and uh, your contemporaries uh, perceive an identification with, with, with a school? Yes, yes. Although, at the same time, very much aware of the division between not only Meyer and Mises, already Wieser and Mises. You see, they were very much aware that there were two, two traditions, the bohm tradition and the Wieser tradition. And Mises was representing the bohm tradition and uh, Meyer representing the Wieser tradition. And where did the line between the two go? It, there was a political, uh, politically ideological line in part. Very little. I mean, bohm had already been an outright liberal, Mises even more, while Wieser was uh, slightly tainted with Fabian socialist sympathies. In fact, it was his great pride to have given a scientific foundation for progressive taxation. <coughs> uh, but otherwise, there wasn't really. I mean, Mies, uh, Wieser, of course, would have claimed to be a liberal, but he was using it much more in a later sense, not a classical level. And, uh, of course, Wieser and Bohm Bawak had been personally very close friends, although Wieser always refused to discuss economics, and in fact, I'm told, began to avoid Bohm Bawak because Bohm Bawak insisted on talking <laughs> economics <laughs> all the time. Out of school, yes. Of course, there's a famous episode which is rather similar that uh, in the, before the war, immediately before, Marshall used to go to the Austrian Dolomites for his summer holiday, and for a time Wieser went to the next village, and uh, they knew of each other, but made no attempt to make contact with it. And then Bombabe came on a visit and insisted on visiting them both, bringing them together and to talk economics, with the result that neither Wieser nor, uh, nor Marshall returned to the place. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So Ben Barberk apparently could be a bit of a bore on insisting on talking economics all the time. At least to his brother-in-law. Yeah. No, not all the time. I mean, I don't think that with my grandfather, who was a personal friend and cool mountain climber and the academic colleague of his, who was not interested in economics, but who was a, originally a constitutional lawyer and then became head of the, of the Austrian Statistical Office. I don't think he talked economics with him, he would talk general politics with him, but not uh, technical economics, which my grandfather was not interested in. So what were the differences then between the Meyer circle and the Mises circle? Oh, things like the measurability of utility and such uh, sophisticated points. I mean, uh, Wieser and the whole tradition really believed in a measurable utility and uh, did not Meyer abandon that? Yes, of course Meyer 
also a thing he was more sophisticated about it, but he still adhered to this. He was puzzled by such question of what's the sum of the utilities of things which items which had a decreasing utility was was there a total utility which was like the uh, uh, area under the curve or was it the multiple of the marginal utility such problems were hotly disputed in my assignment <laughs> yes. but that doesn't explain a split between the two groups or or uh well there wasn't really you see Meyer with the exception of Rosenstein who perhaps for this reason kept away from but also for political reasons kept away from the Mises circle there were no very good Meyer pupils I mean uh, Marr who became his successor while a very well informed person was really a great boy, he had no original ideas of any kind. And there were one or two other very young men whose name I cannot uh, remember now, who died young, who had been more interested. Because there was one very interesting person in Vienna whom we haven't mentioned. Now there was, a, so to speak, an intermediate generation between the Mises Meyer Schumpeter generation and ours which belongs to Striegel, whom I have mentioned, who was a much more distinguished man than he is remembered for. There was a very interesting man, Shams, who wrote largely on semi-methodological problems, very intelligently and well informed. And there was this curious man, Schoenfeld, who later wrote under the name of Ille, a complicated story connected with Nazi anti-Semitic things. He, his uh, adopted father, Schoenfeld, was Jewish and he himself was not Jewish and then he changed the name into Illy, who was probably the only one who made original contributions on the Visa Meyer lines. And while I could not now explain what it was, I believe there's more in his work than has yet been absorbed. I think if you want to get the upshot of the other tradition, it's the work of Schoenfeld more than anywhere else that's to be found. Hmm. That is interesting. Illy, I should say, because his main book is known as a book by Illy. But Striegel and so on were uh, older. Uh, Striegel and these other two were older. Yeah, older. And, and that is in part why uh, there was no use for you and your contemporaries to wait around for a chair. Uh, certainly, yes. I mean, we all expected the injustice. Uh, Striegel should have become um, Meyer's successor, but he, I don't know whether he lived long enough or died before. Anyhow, we all took it for granted that the claimant to the chair was Striegel. Yes. Well, Meyer survived the war, didn't he? And uh, yes, I uh, right. My Striegel died during the war and Meyer survived it. But uh, that wasn't before C. Well, he survived it, but not in uh, active uh, occupation of professorship. He had retired. And I believe the appointment was made at a time of bar, I'm not sure of that, when Striegel was still alive. But I, I can't say for certain. Anyhow, we took it for granted that there was an obvious successor in the person of Sriel, whom we all would have wished to get it. <coughs> we yes. all agreed he deserved it. Yeah. But you were all, uh, you and Haberler, Maklub, Morgenstern, and several of the others as well, um, moved from, from Austria. And uh, only a couple of, of the members of the Geistkreis were still in Vienna when the Anschluss came. Well, uh, yes, but the uh, thing was, uh, <coughs> for <coughs> I was the only one who was quite independent of politics. See, for the age of 32, you offered a professorship in London, you just take it, I mean, there's no problem about it. It was completely, it was as unexpected as uh, 40 years later, the Nobel Prize, it came something out of the clear sky where I never expected such a thing to happen and if it's offered to you, you would take it. That was in 31 when Hitler hadn't even risen to power in Germany. 
So it was in no way affected by political considerations. In the later 30s, when Haberle and Machlub and Mises left, I think the clouds were so clearly visible that everybody tried to get out in time. So even if they are not technically refugees who were forced to leave, they were, had left because the uh, prospects were so very bad. Of course, Morgenstern was lucky being in America when Hitler came on a visit when Hitler took over and he just stayed. Yes, he told me that he got a telegram from some yeah. friend who said, do not return. Yeah. Um, that he was known to be on a blacklist at that, at mm, that point. Very likely, yes. Now, in the 20s, were most of the economists in Vienna at that time liberals in the, in the traditional yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, very few. St wa Striegel was not. He was, a, if anything, a socialist. Schams was not. Morgenstern was not. I think it reduces to Habele, Machlub and myself. <laughs> so, th my previous question was, was there an Austrian school? And you said yes, definitely. Uh, theoretically, yes. The in, in theory. Oh, in that sense, and the term, the meaning of the term has changed. At that time, we would use the term Austrian school quite irrespective of the political consequences we drew from it. It was the marginal utility analysis, which to us was the Austrian school. Deriving from uh, Menger, uh, by either Wieser or Bern yes, yes. And, um, and the association with, uh, with liberal uh, ideological beliefs was not yet there. Well, the Menger, Bern uh, Mises tradition had always been liberal, but that was not regarded as an essential attribute of the Austrian school. It was right. that wing, which was the liberal wing of the school. Yeah, and the Geistkreis was not predominantly oh no, liberal either. From it. And what about Mises' seminar? Again, not. I mean, you had Schams and Striegel there, and uh, Engel Janus is a historian, and uh, Kaufmann, who certainly was not in that sense a liberal. Schütz, who hardly was, he was perhaps closer to us. Fögelin, who was not. No, no, they... Oh, I think the women members of the seminar were very devout Mises pupils, even in that sense. I mean, it's perhaps common, the women are more susceptible to the views of the master than the men were. But uh, among the men, it was certainly not the predominant uh, believes. So, in the revival of interest in the Austrian school that, that has taken place in recent years in the, in the United States... Uh, it means the Mises school. It means the, the Mises group. I am now but being associated with Mises, but initially I think it meant the pupil which Mises had taught in the United States. And uh, some very reluctantly now admit me as a second head. I mean, I don't think people like Rothbard or some of the immediate Mises pupils are really very happy that they are not, the rest are not orthodox Misesians, but uh, take part of the views from me rather than from Mises. In that group, um, an attempt is often made to um, draw connections between the particular interests and theoretical teachings of the Austrian school and um, liberal, I should say, libertarian mm. ideology. Um, do you think that there, there is something in the, in the um, theoretical tradition? Yes. Uh, yes, I would uh, very definitely maintain that the methodological individualism does lead to political individualism. I don't think they would all admit it, but uh, in the form in which I have now been led to put it, 
this idea of the utilization of dispersed knowledge, I would maintain that uh, our political conclusions follow very directly from the theoretical insights. But that's not generally admitted. I'm not speaking about the opponents, of course, not admitted among them. I think it's even in the... Well, I think in the American Austrian school, yes, it is now generally admitted. Uh, the young people would not call one an Austrian who was not both a methodological individualist and a political individualist. But this a that applies to the younger school and uh, was not a tradition. And as far as you are concerned, those ideas belong to the mid-30s and later, yes, yes. and not to the Austrian school when it still was in Austria. Uh, yes, you're quite right. You have um, developed your own views on methodology over the years. Did you have a conflict with Mises on methodological matters? No, no conflict, although I failed in my attempt to make him see my point. But he took it more good-naturedly than in most other instances. Uh, I believe it's in that same article on economics and knowledge where I make the point that while the analysis of uh, individual planning is in a way an a priori system of logic. The empirical element comes in in people learning about what other people do. And you can't claim, as Mises does, that the whole theory of the market is an a priori system because the empirical factor which comes in that one person learns about what another person does. That was a gentle attempt to persuade Mises to give up the a priori claim, but I failed in persuading him. Professor Hayek, I'd like to uh, go back over uh, the area that you've now been discussing with Professor Bork and ask you a little bit about how your ideas developed over time. Um, your ideas on complex systems that are uh, not designed but uh, evolve over time. Uh, where, where are the sources in your earlier work? Where was the sensory order and the early work you did on psychology and so on um, more important? Or um, would you stress more perhaps the work that you did in economics on socialist calculation and the complexity of, of economic systems? Well, it somehow all converged uh, very curiously. What I did on the socialism raised all sorts of methodological problems. In fact, if you read uh, that essay which I wrote as the introductory concluding essay to the volume on collectivist economic planning, there are certain hints of my methodological things. Then, of course, there uh, was the series of studies on the history of ideas, which were published as the counter-revolution of science, when I went into positivism, really starting out from... Uh, well, uh, perhaps I should say put it differently. Already at that time, in the late 30s, I'd formed a plan for large work, which was to be called The Abuse and Decline of Reason. Uh, it was, I think, in connection with my work on socialism, that I had become aware of the influence of constructivist, positivist ideas, scientific ideas, and uh, that, that led me to that plan of a two-volume work, one history of ideas showing how the Cartesian rationalism began to influence ideas on social problems. And in fact, what I did then was to be followed by a chapter on Marx and Hegel, which I could never bring myself to write because I disliked these people too much. 
and uh, the later development in the 19th century, and then a second volume <coughs> dealing with the decline of reason, the effect of this constructed society on blocking the evolution of thought. And uh, I had all this in mind when I wrote it up as a practical pamphlet as I wrote a serfdom, which was really an advanced sketch of what was meant to be the second part of that great thing. But uh, the, the psychological work also contributed, because there I suddenly faced another highly complex system, which I was becoming more and more clear we could never explain in detail. In that case, even, it was an absolute obstacle, because, uh, as I put it then, I believe, you can never classify something which is as complex as the classifying apparatus. See, I interpret the brain as a classifying apparatus, and the classifying machine must always be <coughs> more complex than what it classifies. And so I came there to the conclusion there are certain phenomena where we can only hope to explain the formation of a pattern as a principle which without ever making specific predictions of what we do in particular circumstances. Or the details of the structure. Yes. So I learned in my psychological work a great deal which was useful to the methodology of the social sciences. So in a sense, the original work about the role of uh, expectations and anticipations which already led my uh, attention to the role of knowledge and information via the socialist work, via the work on the history of ideas, and finally the psychological work. I think by the time I published the sensory order and turned back to economics, the general equipment was ready. I first decided to use it to write a restatement of classical liberal doctrine, and almost immediately after it completed the sensory order, started working on the constitution of liberty, which is no more than an up-to-date statement of classical doctrine. And only when I'd finished that, I became aware that classical doctrine had left certain questions unanswered. <coughs> so I started on the new thing which in a way is much more personal and I believe original just because it tackles problems which had not been solved. The law, le what led up to the law legislation and yes. liberty. Mm. So uh, in effect when you uh, wrote the constitution of liberty, uh, the, the insights that you have gained through writing the sensory order yes. and that had come out of the earlier economic work uh, you, you later on felt did not permeate the constitution of liberty sufficiently at that time. And that's uh, why well you have... Well, yes, I mean, uh, the constitution of liberty didn't, was not really an original book. It's a restatement in terms of my whole approach of classical liberal doctrine. But uh, the essential problems, which I only saw later, the definition of law, the exact relation between abstract rules and the formation of an order, and finally the re see seeing the defect of our present constitutional arrangements, all this came only after I'd finished the uh, Constitution of Liberty. As I say, I believe in the preface, if I had not used the term Constitution of Liberty for that book, I would have preferred to give it to the present book, which is much more aiming to construct a Constitution of Liberty. Yes. <coughs> um, let me ask another question. Uh, a historian uh, of ideas that uh -huh. went through your work in the succession that it was public, uh -huh. uh, published would see first the work in uh, economics on business uh -huh. cycles and malfunctions mm. of that complex order, then the work on socialist calculation, mm. then the theory of complex systems, mm -hmm. and then the sensory order. Yes. But I think that you told me once that the sensory order uh, 
uh, was the first scientific work you had ever done that uh, you yes, began on that uh, much earlier? Certainly, I did it in 1920, but uh, nothing like what the ultimate book was. The basic idea that uh, you can account for the difference of sensory qualities essentially by difference, on the one hand, as a classification process of nervous se uh, perceptions, on the other hand, as uh, determined by the effects to which it leads, I had achieved in 1918. But on the methodological side, significance all, 1920, I had no idea. That was only, perhaps even I would say, my experience gained in economics applying to my original problem, which made me finally see the methodological problem of the nature of complex, pheno complex phenomena. But that really was my <coughs> question, whether uh. the published sequence of your ideas is mm -hmm. also the evolved sequence of yeah. your ideas or whether uh, the sensory order, uh, the basic ideas there, really stimulated your earlier work in economics? I doubt it. Well then, uh, from the theory of complex systems and the constitution of liberty, how do, how do we go from there to your later work on the philosophy of law. Um, can you tell me how, how it led on to your present positions on uh, that now are in law legislation and liberty? You said before that mm -hmm. the constitution of liberty well, I left you unsatisfied in this one respect. Uh, yes, I don't know how gradually I became aware eh, that I I hadn't got a remedy against the actual tendencies and this idea of this division or reintroducing the old idea of separation of powers on the highest level was a later conception. Similarly, uh, this uh, detailed study of the concept of law which led me into legal philosophy, much more than I had done in uh, the Constitution of Liberty, was merely an awakened interest which led me on to read and uh, acquire much wider knowledge of the historical background. But the thing occurs to me that, uh, of course, in a sense, it also led me back to, back to economics. Uh, because I have, I, in the habit of saying, I have made two inventions as distinguished from discoveries. The one is a new type of constitution and the other is my new monetary scheme because I have come to the conclusion that it's not sufficient to deprive government of other arbitrary powers but you can never hope to preserve a free economic order unless we take from government the monopoly of issuing money. Uh, so this forces me now back to rethink a good deal of monetary theory and I'm at the moment uh, trying to get back to... Well, I probably never told you this. The first book on which I had started, which I've never uh, written, I had proposed as a doctoral thesis of the New York University in 1923, which was to be... Uh, have in the title at least the question, is the stabilization of the value of money compatible with its functions? And uh, these were the, my first problems on which I originally worked and which I'm now thinking again, so I've gone full search. <laughs> but a few years back you wouldn't have anticipated ever coming back to no, monetary no, theory. No, I didn't. It was really that uh, I became aware that there's no chance of effectively limiting the power of government over the economy except by depriving it, uh, plus the insight that you can, <coughs> with the present political order, it's impossible for government to conduct a sensible monetary policy. Yeah. Would, it, would you agree to the characterization of your uh, uh, later work that it, it differs uh, 
uh, from the Constitution of Liberty, for example, in the great emphasis that you put on culturally evolved systems and culturally evolved rules, and the distinction between uh, constructed uh, rules or imposed rules and uh, spontaneously evolved rules. Well, as you know, it became fully conscious only after it completed the book and they put it in the postscript, <laughs> because that was when I suddenly saw it as a whole. But you are quite right that it's probably permeated by gradual uh, becoming aware of the importance of this aspect. You're referring now to the Hobhouse the lectures. Hobhouse lectures on the three sources of human values. Yes, which of course is to go as an epilogue into volume three of Law, Legislation and Liberty. Could, could you briefly characterize the three sources? For well, I think best by saying again what I say in the opening passages, that uh, some rather crude f formulations of the social biologists one of whom insisted there were only two sources of value, innate ones, and deliberate constructed ones, proved a complete neglect of the great central stream of cultural evolution. And only when I became aware that people were capable of completely neglecting it, that I began to think systematically about cu how cultural evolution... Of course, I had plenty of material. I mean, I had constantly accumulated material on the topic. But to put it in this systematic form was caused by this curious, naive statement of one of the social biologists, which completely neglected the existence of this sort of evolution.